And the other thing I did is I took off and I started working with some overseas relief organizations all around the world. Been in prisons in Mexico and uh, been in Africa many times. And um, one, one of my trips to Tanzania, East Africa. It's very interesting. We went over there to, to work with kids that their parents had died of AIDS. And you go there and, and there's generation, two, you know, a couple generations of children that are not going to have parents because their parents have died of AIDS. Some of the numbers are, you know, one out of every three women in parts of Tanzania have AIDS, one out of every four men. And we'd stand there with hundreds and hundreds of children in these church and school courtyards and how they kept a smile on their face, I have no idea. But um, I, was, I was over there. They asked me to give a speech in Tanzania the, the first trip time I went over there to East Africa. My first trip was I was there about a month. And uh, I'd just gotten in the country, didn't know much about the country and the people yet. And they asked me to speak to about 4,000 Tanzanians uh, sitting on the hillside there. And I had a translator with me, a, a friend of mine. His name was Daniel. He lived there in Tanzania. And we're walking to the podium, and, and I'm going to speak to all these people, and he's going to translate my talk. And I turn to Daniel and say, Daniel, I, you know, I just got here, please tell me a word in Swahili so they'll know I'm trying to learn their language or culture and everything. I say, how do you say welcome in <coughs> Swahili? And he says, Mr. Steve, you say Jambo, J-A-M-B-O, Jambo. So I walk to the podium, they have a mic, and I grab the mic, and the, it's beautiful, you know, afternoon, people sitting on the hillside. And, and instead of saying Jambo, which means welcome, I say jamba, I put an A on the end instead of an O, and 4,000 people laugh at me. I, I have no idea what I just <laughs> said. I know I didn't say jambo, though. So I give my little talk. Daniel, you know, he translates it, and, and we go sit back down. And I turn to Daniel, my translator, and I say, Daniel, I, I, I meant to say jambo. He said, oh, Mr. Steve, you did not say jambo. I say, yeah, but I meant to say jambo. No, 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 you said jamba very, very bad in Swahili. <laughs> And I, I go, great, what did I say? And he says, well, jambo in Swahili means welcome. But jamba in Swahili means you let gas, you let gas. <laughs> um, yeah, they haven't invited me back. So No, no they have. I, it, I've gone back several times. Wonderful country, wonderful people. Um, you know, there's, there's a wonderful story. I don't, I don't know if Elaine knows this story, or Marty knows this story. Um, you know, our family, it, it was really about transformation and change. I mean, to go from the Nixon administration to Jerry Ford, the guy from the Midwest, it was about going from a president who, who was about secrecy and, you know, there was a paranoia and he had an enemies list to Jerry Ford, a guy from Grand Rapids, Michigan opened his life to everybody and it was a transparency as far as the two different presidencies. And, and, and that's this idea of change and transformation. There was this great story that happened, must have been a little over eight years ago. Dad was back at the um, Republican National Convention in Philadelphia. And they asked him, he gave a short speech there. My mom was there with him. And on the way back to the hotel, Dad had a, a mild stroke. Had, they raced him to the hospital there in Philadelphia. And Mom was with him. The kids, we weren't back there. And we all flew back that night. And uh, Dad had to go in for a, uh, some, what they called exploratory surgery to deal with this stroke and everything. So we sat with Dad in his hospital room the night before the surgery. And, you know, I mean, we did what you do with your father when he's getting ready to have surgery. You know, we're talking to him, holding his hand, we're praying with him, encouraging him, and getting him ready for surgery. And the next morning, I'm standing outside the recovery room as they're bringing Dad out from the surgery. And this man walks up to me and says, I want to tell you how much the world has changed. And he had, to me, it sounded like a heavy European accent. He says, when I first saw your father, he was my enemy. I was a 14-year-old boy in my country, and I saw your father get off the plane on my Russian TV to meet with President Brezhnev of Russia to deal with nuclear arms. I was a 14-year-old Russian boy, and I saw your father back in, it must have been 1975. He was my enemy. 
And here I am some 20 years later in this part of this hospital and part of that team in there during that surgery helping save your father's life now. That's change. That's transformation. And I thought about it, and I, you know, I walked out of there and went, my gosh, you know, this, this guy was a 14-year-old boy. He saw my father, and dad must, I think he was over there with the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. They were dealing with that, and he's just a young boy, and he sees my dad in the Cold War, and he's my enemy, and here we fast forward 25 years later, and he's one of the medical staff saving my father's life 25 years later. That's change, that's transformation. That's how much the world is changing around us all the time. So I, I, that story just always fascinates me. And it makes me think, do I live my life in a way that allows that kind of change and transformation to happen in my own life? That's just kind of a question I ponder all the time. Um, well, I see I've gotten off track already, so I'm going to get back on track here. And I know we've got a limited amount of time, and then we'll do some question and answer. I'll, I'll share with you how our family got catapulted into the White House. Uh, it was. Uh, October of 1973. At that time, Richard Nixon was president of the United States. His vice president was Spiro Agnew, who got caught in a uh, bribery scandal, had to step down from office, and Richard Nixon was looking for a new vice president. And there was a list of probably, I don't know, possibly five to ten people that might be considered as the next vice president. That list would have looked uh, Governor Nelson Rockefeller, John Connolly of Texas, those kind of people were the names probably at the top of that list. Uh, Dad's name was on that list, but I think we all thought that Dad's name was at the bottom of that list. He'd been a congressman here from Grand Rapids for um, 13 re-elections, 26 years. And my mother had finally got him, Dad to retire. He was not going to run for Congress. And, and, and we were talking to Hillary, you said you ran his last campaign. And, we were talking, dad, you know, mom had not wanted to be the wife of a politician and, and she'd endured living in Washington, D.C. for 20 some years. Finally got dad to retire and he was going to serve out that term and they were going to move back to Grand Rapids and live here. Except Richard Nixon changed all that. Uh, we were told, all the people that might be selected as vice president, they were told that at 7.30 that night, the White House was going to call whoever they chose to be vice president. Then they were going to announce it nas nationally at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We lived in a little house outside of Washington, D.C., Alexandria, Virginia. And um, that night, Dad got called. We were having dinner, and the phone rang. and. General Alexander Haig was on the other end of that line, and uh, he said, Congressman Ford, the President of the United States has something that he thinks both you and your wife Betty should hear at the same time. And, and uh, they got on the phone, and Richard Nixon asked him to be his next vice president. Now, this didn't make my mother really happy. <laughs> she was ready for retirement in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I remember my dad getting off the phone and talking to her later and saying, Betty, don't worry, vice presidents don't do anything, you know? <laughs> and uh, history proved that wrong, so. Um, but that was October, October 1973. Uh, at that time, Watergate was a pretty small item in the news. It was not what it would become later, and over the next 10 months, Watergate grew, and 10 months later, August 1974, Richard Nixon stepped down from office and Dad became president, took over the reins of this country. At a tough time, very difficult time. I remember I stood out on the South Lawn of the, the, the White House as, and I think a lot of us remember that picture of Richard Nixon on the, the steps of the helicopter saying goodbye to his staff, family, and friends on the South Lawn of the White House. Um, we saw the helicopter leave. We went in, walked into the East Room of the White House. They were going to have a very small swearing in ceremony. And to, to sort of paint a picture of, we, here we just went through an inauguration of a new president. And, and what we saw was galas and balls and, and celebrations. That's not what this was. This was a very, very dark moment in American history. You had a man who was going to go in, take the oath of office, that had not been elected by the American people. He had not gone through a general election to be elected as president. 